uh, physics of the oceans at Potsdam University, and he is also the head of Earth Systems Analysis at PIC, which is the Potsdam Institute for Clean Proportion or Climate uh, Impact uh, Research. He has many other academic and professional affiliations, including uh, that he is a member of the Academia Europea and also the German Advisory Council on Global Change. He has uh, also won the $1 million Centennial Fellowship Award of uh, the McDonald uh, Foundation. He has uh, also contributed to the Nobel Peace Prize of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 2007 because he was also a lead author of the fourth uh, assessment report. He has published many papers in Nature and Science and uh, some of them have been really groundbreaking and has really um, rang the alarm about climate change and several times, he's many times among the people who warn us that unfortunately even a few months ago we were still <coughs> wrong and the things are going in the worse direction than uh, we thought before. So without uh, much further ado, I would like to give uh, the floor to Professor Ramsdorf, who I think is going to confirm uh, the optimistic views that which were quoted by our provost this morning, and I'm sure he's going to say that there is no climate crisis at all, and in the coffee break we can all go home. <laughs> Isn't that so? So the floor is yours. Students, dear ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to speak here and uh, it's been a great pleasure to listen to Dennis Meadows, who's been a hero of my school years. I actually <laughs> I first got into the, the environmental <coughs> science issue by doing a school assignment, uh, giving a talk about the limits to growth and that, that set me on the path that brought me here today, so to speak. And uh, I've never met Dennis Meadows in person before, so it's a, a great pleasure for me to do so. My job is to give you a quick overview over the fundamentals of climate science. And I start with a, a different view of what Dennis has already shown. The CO2 concentration is increasing, and uh, this picture is from the IPCC report and puts it into a longer term context. We see here the last 10,000 years, that is the Holocene, and we know the CO2 concentration during that time from the ice cores in Antarctica. In fact, we now know it 800,000 years back in time from the latest ice core drilled by the European team. And uh, we can see this very exceptional increase in the carbon dioxide concentration happening over the last 100 years or so. Levels we have now in the atmosphere are much higher than any time during the past 800,000 years. We know also, by the way, where this is coming from. This is completely certain. This is entirely due to human emissions. And one reason why we know is uh, because of uh, isotopic analysis. The fossil CO2 has a different isotope signature compared to uh, the carbon dioxide that naturally cycles in the ocean biosphere and so on. Uh, but there is a much simpler reason to know that we cause this increase. We simply know how much we emit it. We know how much in terms of coal, oil and gas we have burned and so we know how much carbon dioxide has come out of that. And the increase we observe in the atmosphere is actually only about half as much as we have put into the atmosphere. So there is no question that the natural Earth system has somehow released part of that carbon dioxide. Uh, no, exactly the opposite. The natural system has actually taken up about half of the carbon dioxide that we have emitted into the air. So how did it do that? Um, the, the main answer is the oceans have taken up some of that CO2 that we put into the air due to the gas exchange at the surface of the oceans. And in one way that's a good thing because it has slowed down the increase of CO2 in the air, but on the other hand, I'm an ocean scientist, it's also a very bad thing because this <coughs> makes the oceans more acidic. They have already become about 30% more acidic due to that CO2 increase and this is a major threat to marine ecosystems because a lot of organisms in the ocean form calcium carbonate shells 
like the ordinary seashells that we know, or coral reefs, for example, are made of calcium carbonate. And even more importantly, although invisible, these microscopic organisms that you see on this uh, nice uh, photo here, they form the basis of the food webs in the ocean, and they also can only work if they can form their calcium carbonate shells, and they can't do that anymore if the oceans get too acidic. We'll reach that point in about 40 or 50 years if we keep emitting CO2 as we have done in the past, and then we really start to critically damage our ocean ecosystems. For me, that would be enough reason to stop the rise in CO2, even if CO2 was not a greenhouse gas and did not affect climate. Just the ocean acidification problem would be enough to stop us uh, from going on. But of course we also know that CO2 is a greenhouse gas, and that's been well known since the 19th century. It was demonstrated in 1859 by experiments uh, by John Tyndall at the Royal Institution in London. So that was the same year that Darwin published his Origin of Species. The experiments were actually shown how CO2 absorbs um, long-wave radiation, which is this heat-trapping property that uh, Dennis has already explained. And uh, this effect was actually predicted and quantified for the first time by the Swedish Nobel laureate Svante Arrhenius in a famous paper in the year 1896 when he calculated that a doubling of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere would lead to a warming somewhere between 4 and 6 degrees. Now there were a few um, problems with his calculation, but the basic number that he got is not far off. Um, Today, we call this number the climate sensitivity because it tells us how strongly does the climate respond if you change the greenhouse gas concentration. And the modern estimates are around about 3 degrees. So for a doubling of the CO2 concentration, we get about 3 degrees warming. And uh, although uh, the, the letter from the Financial Times that the provost cited says the climate system is intrinsically unpredictable, that's not actually true. It's uh, true that weather is intrinsically unpredictable, but the climate system follows a basic law of energy conservation. It's the first uh, law of thermodynamics, so it's one of the most fundamental principles of physics. Um, there is an energy conservation principle, and that was also what uh, is, of course, behind that uh, nice uh, engineering type model scheme that Dennis put up about the climate system, the basic in there that I saw spotted immediately is energy conservation. You have a balance of heat coming in from the sun and heat going out, radiated into space by the earth. And if you change that balance so that uh, you prevent heat from going out, it will accumulate and the system will heat up. It's uh, no different from your pot of water on the stove, if you turn the stove up and you put heat into that water, it's going to get warmer. So this is entirely predictable and governed by the basic laws of physics, even though, of course, many other aspects of climate, the details about how does the ocean circulation respond, how does the ice respond, they are much more complex and they are indeed difficult to predict. But the basic fact that if you increase the greenhouse gas concentration, it's going to get warmer, is entirely predictable. It was predicted, and it is happening exactly as was predicted by science. And you can actually calculate from that climate sensitivity. You don't need a complicated model. If you know the climate sensitivity with pencil and paper, you very quickly can calculate it. How much warming the change in radiation balance that humans have caused up to this day should have caused by now. And uh, if you accept that three degrees climate sensitivity, which is supported by many, many studies, then uh, you find that what we have done so far should have caused a warming between 0.7 and 0.9 degrees centigrade. Now that's a prediction of science that we can compare it with what has actually happened. And you see we have actually a warming of 0 0.8 degrees. And that already shows you that the observed warming is exactly as predicted by anthropogenic effects, which already tells you that the natural effects over this time period uh, must have been small, and that's indeed the case. There are, of course, always natural uh, causes for climate variations as well, and uh, the biggest one in the past 100 years was the variation in solar activity, 
but uh, that actually has contributed only about 15% to the warming that we have seen in the past 100 years and nothing to the warming that we have seen in the past 25 years because solar activity has actually gone down in the past 25 years. Now, um, to come back to that uh, Financial Times letter to the editor, uh, it mentioned global cooling. If you look at the internet, uh, there are lots of climate skeptics websites and they're all full of this global cooling theme, which comes from, um, I don't have a laser pointer, but I, I show you uh, what it is. Here we have 1998, here we have 2008, and people argue, well, this is much cooler than it was 10 years ago, so we've got global cooling. Um, this is, of, of course, a completely nonsensical argument. If you pick the, the very warmest year of the 20th century and compare it to the coldest year of the 21st, I mean, you, um, this is just natural variability, what we are looking at. Even if you calculate a proper trend, as any uh, scientist with a training in statistics will do, which doesn't just take the two endpoints, but actually all the 11 points from 1998 to 2008, it's still an upward trend. There is still warming. And by the way, 2009 will end up again near that uh, thick trend line that I show there, which is a, a, a long-term moving average. Um, I mentioned that this warming was entirely predicted. 1965, there was the first uh, expert report to the United States uh, president warning very strongly that we would get a major global warming due to our CO2 emissions. And um, in 1972, in a famous paper in Nature, it was predicted that there would be 0 0.5 degree warming by the year 2000. This is exactly what happened. Scientists had predicted this well before the warming really took off and, and was demonstrated in the climate data. And for decades, this warming is unfolding exactly as predicted. So. Um, not only has this been predictable, it has actually been predicted and it is happening as the scientists have said we had warned beforehand. One of the uh, consequences is the shrinking sea ice, which uh, Dennis has already shown and oops, I went too far. So this is what it looks like in 2007 and that's 1979. So I think it's pretty clear the dramatic change that we have seen in the sea ice extent in the Arctic Ocean. Now, uh, we have already seen this time series. There are two extra points I want to make here. First of all, this decline in ice has been much <coughs> faster than the climate models predicted. So as I mentioned, some aspects are more complex than global temperature. For example, the ice cover and the models can be wrong. And unfortunately, in those cases where we find our climate models uh, are not quite right, uh, we have underestimated the problem rather than being too alarmist, as we're sometimes accused of in the media. Now, the second problem, uh, the second issue I want to briefly mention uh, Dennis said there is positive feedbacks which amplify climate change, which can lead to tipping points. That's all uh, completely correct, but this is a bad example. Mm because this, this ice minimum in 2007 that you saw there uh, is not due to this positive ice albedo feedback. It was simply due to natural variability in the atmospheric mm. circulation. The wind conditions in 2007 happened to blow a lot of ice uh, southward out of the Arctic into the open Atlantic. And that's why 2007 was particularly low. And some other years, you see, they stick up above uh, the long-term trend. So from individual years, we can't conclude very much because they're strongly dominated by weather. But uh, of course, this downward trend, that is affected by that positive feedback here. So one, one just shouldn't focus on an individual year there where most likely on that short time scales, the weather dominates everything. Now, what will happen in the future if we know the climate sensitivity, if we know the emissions? It's pretty easy to calculate how much warming we will get. And uh, also, it's clear that the amount of warming will depend most strongly on how much we will emit in terms of greenhouse gases. So there are different scenarios. And uh, it's not up to us climate scientists to say how much we will emit. All we can do is say, if such an amount will be emitted, then how much warmer will it get? And that's what we do for these different emission scenarios that are shown in the different colors here. And now if we take a very optimistic scenario with relatively low emissions, we'll end up somewhere between two and three degrees above the pre-industrial temperatures. 
But if we follow that red, uh, red track here, the A1FI scenario, which is what we've been following up to this year, then we end up somewhere between 4 and 7 degrees warming above pre-industrial. And that happens to be just the difference between the, the height of the last ice age and today. This is going to be a completely different planet if we have 4 to 7 degrees warming. And I don't recommend going there. Uh, I certainly don't want my kids to grow up in this world following this rigid uh, trajectory there. And the global mean is only uh, quite a deceptive measure, of course, because we live in individual places. So let's look at this in high resolution from the, the most high resolution climate model. Up to there, you just see weather, basically, natural variability. This was run by the Japanese colleagues, by the way, on the Earth simulator, which for many years was the fastest supercomputer on Earth. Now you start to see orange colors uh, starting to become prevalent, so the warming signal starts to overwhelm the natural weather variability, particularly strongly in the Arctic, as you can see, but there's also a hotspot in the Himalayas. Now that is exactly due to that amplifying feedback that Dennis mentioned, the ice and the snow cover shrinks, so more sunlight is absorbed, less is reflected. And um, another thing, and yeah, maybe I should just silently let this run its course, it is quite impressive. This is not an extreme scenario. This is a global mean warming of four degrees, what we see here. So it's not extreme. And the point I want to make is four degrees in global mean will mean six or more degrees over most land areas of the world, and that's where we live. The oceans remain much cooler because of various simple physical reasons. Um, but the land areas where we grow our food, where we live, uh, they don't follow that global mean temperature curve that you always see. They will warm a lot more, and in some areas, like the high latitudes and the Arctic, you can get 10, 12, or even more degrees warming for just 4 degrees global warming, and that is an important message to keep in mind. Now the other message is that it's uh, not just the, the average temperatures, it's extremes that count. We have seen a major heat wave in Europe in summer 2003. Um, at least 35,000 uh, casualties, uh, more modern estimates come up at numbers that are more like 70,000 excess deaths in that heat wave in the summer of 2003. Now this kind of heat wave uh, was a complete rare outlier at the time, but the model simulations show that by the 2040s, every other summer will be as warm as 2003, and by the 2060s, we will hardly ever get a cool summer as 2003 has been. Temperatures are also not everything because the water cycle, <coughs> precipitation, etc., is uh, more important to agriculture, for example. Now, the big picture shows what is actually measured in Europe, and it's a trend towards uh, drying out of southern Europe and uh, especially the Mediterranean region. And that is, again, something that is entirely happening as predicted. The inset shows uh, a model study for Europe for how the pre precipitation will change in a CO2 scenario in a climate model, and you see exactly the pattern that is actually observed, namely a drying out of the Mediterranean region. And one of the consequences is the massively increased risk of forest fires that go out of control, and we are almost used to it now that every summer on the TV news we see these fire images from Portugal, Spain, Italy, or Greece, and usually they say, well, the fires have been uh, lighted by people, etc. That's all true, but the reason why they go so out of control is the unprecedented uh, drought conditions that are developing over the last decades in southern Europe. And the similar picture uh, you see in all the subtropical regions around the world, California, Australia, southern Africa, and so on. Another direct consequence of warming is sea level rise. Here again I show you simply the observed data and sea level has risen about 20 centimeters in the last 100 years. And um, you can also see that this rise has accelerated. It was uh, not so steep in the beginning of the century and it's getting steeper and steeper. And uh, I put this little inset of the size will be nuclear power station in Great Britain here just as a, one example of uh, critical infrastructure that we have very close to sea level. There is lots of that. 
sea level actually uh, last time it was about two to three degrees warmer in uh, on this planet it was three million years ago in the pliocene sea level was 25 to 35 meters higher then due to the smaller ice sheets now um, nobody cared much about it back then, but we would care with all this stuff on our coats, not only nuclear power stations, but uh, lots of refineries, chemical industries, cities, and so on. So w in this situation that we are in now, we can't even afford a one or two meter sea level rise, let alone 20 or 30. This rise is also something that is happening faster than our models predicted. The observed trend in the satellite data is 3.4 millimeters per year, and the best estimate of the IPCC for that time period was 1.9 millimeters per year, so it's worse than expected. Or maybe it's better, much better than expected. This is something you read again and again in the media, not only in letters to the editor, um, this is just one example uh, from the British Guardian, where it says over the past two years sea levels have not increased at all. Actually, they show a slight drop. Should we not be told that this is much better than expected? This always kind of insinuates the climate scientists are alarmists, they're telling you all these alarmist things, but shouldn't we be told that it's much better than expected? Not many people uh, say nonsense like this. In this case, it was Björn Lomborg and um, well known probably to most people for this kind of uh, catchy quote. I love the title of his article which he called Let the Data Speak for Itself. Of course he didn't show those data. He <laughs> did refer to this particular data set which is the satellite sea level record, but he didn't show it and he only pointed out that there was for this very short period 2006-2007 sea level was practically flat. Had he shown the full data, of course, his readers would have immediately recognized uh, that he was fooling them. Okay, this is Greenland, and the blue areas show where Greenland is shrinking, where it's losing mass based on remote sensing data, so it is losing mass around the edges, and also overall contributing to sea level rise. You see a lot of things like big meltwater lakes forming on the Greenland ice. You see meltwater streams, the water vanishes in these big moulins, it goes to the base of the ice sheet where it used to be frozen to the bedrock and now gets lifted off it and lubricated by that meltwater. The big outlet glaciers have all started to flow much faster. And the reason why this is of great concern is that in Greenland alone there is enough ice to raise the global sea level by seven meters. So if we destabilize this ice sheet, which the IPCC report concludes happens from above uh, two degrees global warming, then we are in deep trouble and we trigger one of these uh, tipping points where there's no way to stop it once this, is, this process is going because there is a positive feedback that then uh, keeps it all going. Um, I'll skip that just to save a little bit of time because I want to talk about the tipping points a little bit more. I guess I have only a few minutes, right? Um, there are several tipping points where we can trigger large-scale uh, systematic changes in the Earth system that once we go across a certain threshold, there is no way that we can turn this back again. And uh, this is from a paper by Tim Lenton in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which is a review paper. So if you're interested in this, look it up. Um, there are many things like the possibility of the dieback of the Amazon uh, rainforest, sudden shifts in ocean circulation, possibilities of uh, instability in the monsoon, which a lot of people in Asia depend upon for their livelihood, etc. So the more we change the climate and uh, away from its past equilibrium, the bigger the risk becomes that we go across critical thresholds where there's really qualitative changes in the system. Just like in a rowing boat, say if you lean over too much, at a certain point it will flip over and big thing, big qualitative change happens. Another important issue is that global warming is irreversible. We can't decide one day, we've made a mistake, it got too warm, um, let's cool it down again. It's simply not possible because if we go, then go to zero emissions, we can stop further warming, but we can't turn it back. That's shown by this study where the CO2 concentration is shown in the upper panel. And where these curves suddenly bend down, this is where the emissions were from one day to the next 
stop. So this is the most extreme thing we can imagine. We simply stop all the greenhouse gas emissions. What then happens is CO2 concentration will start to decline slowly, but temperature won't, as you see in the bottom panel. Temperature pretty well stays level because the oceans are still catching up and CO2 levels, although they decline, they don't go back to normal, even after a thousand years. <coughs> so if you go to zero emissions, you're stuck for at least a thousand years with the high temperatures. You can prevent them from increasing further, but you can't dial them back to cooler conditions. And so we only have one chance to get this right, and this is doing it right the first time. We can't make a mistake and then decide uh, we've gone too far with warming, because then it will be too late to do anything about it. Um, do you need to stop? Yeah? One minute. One minute, okay. So, <laughs> what we're trying in Copenhagen is to keep the temperatures to a maximum of two degrees, as is shown here. And uh, let me use my one minute to make this point. If you want to limit the warming to two degrees, you only have a certain amount of CO2 left that you are allowed to emit because of the very long lifetime of CO2 in the atmosphere, it only depends on the total amount. So it doesn't matter whether you emit it this year or in 20 years down the line, it all counts to the total overall budget that you still have available. And that happens to be about 700 gigatons if you look at it on an integrated time until 2050. Now at the current rate of emissions, we will have used up this budget in 20 years, uh, so it won't last us 40 years. And the emissions are still increasing, of course. And that shows how, how tough that problem is. And we need to go on a global path that, like this green path. We have to get the emissions way down in the next 40 years. That green path that would actually keep to a budget of 750 gigatons. And this diagram, it's uh, the final message that I want to give, shows you if we wait, we lose it. Now, if you peak the emissions in 2020, like in the red curve, then you have to go down extremely steeply and end up at zero emissions by 2040. And these are reduction rates that every economist will tell you is impossible without crashing our economy. On the green track, we can still do it. We have just um, like 3% reductions per year or so, or two. But um, just waiting another five years or 10 years makes this problem practically unsolvable. So. Although I'm very optimistic that in the long run, we will um, all make wise decisions, but we don't have the long run. We have to make the right decisions now, very soon. We've been waiting and talking since 1992, since the Earth Summit in Rio, when the Climate Convention was signed. And back then, we could have done it all quite slowly and gently. And we've lost all this time, so now the window of opportunity of stopping global warming at a maximum of two degrees is just falling shut as we speak. And that's why Copenhagen <coughs> is of such prime importance. Thanks. <coughs>